can, can you have Christians who are saved but live in sin for a season and still be Christians? If you say no, you just sent David to hell and Solomon to hell. David committed adultery and murdered the man and for all that time kept his sin uncovered, did not repent until God confronted him. Right? I'm now going to confront you and expose you. So he sends Nathan and he says, hey, David. And people think that Nathan was giving a parable. He wasn't. Go read 2 Samuel 12. He doesn't say, uh, David, let me tell you a parable. He says, no. Hey, David, there are two men. One has 99 ewes. That ewe is a baby lamb, right? And there's another one, you know, who's very poor, but he's got a baby lamb that he loves as a dog because it's a pet. It's like you have a puppy, right? So then this man who's rich, who's got 99 ewes, right, has a guest. Instead of killing one of his own, he takes that one ewe of that one man, slaughters it, and feeds it to his guest. David gets livid. That man shall die. And Nathan says, you are that man. man. You are that man. You took Uriah's wife, even though you had many wives and many children from many wives. And all this time, you try to hide your sin, but now I'm going to expose you and shame you publicly. And then David fell on his face. He goes, I have sinned against Yahweh. But then Nathan says something interesting. Second Samuel 12, if you read it. If you read what he says in verse 13, he says, you shall not die, Yahweh has removed your sin. Because why? What was the judgment that David pronounced? That man must die. So he goes, well, then you're that man. You just testified you deserve death. However, God in his mercy has removed your sin, you will not die. You'll be punished, but you won't die. So don't tell me you can't have Christians who are living in sin for a season. I'm not trying to justify them. I say, okay, now go ahead, live in sin. God forbid, we should hate sin with a passion. Yeah, yeah. But just because you find someone in sin, that's still no indication he's not saved. And just because you find someone who's walking in obedience for years, doesn't mean he'll continue to do so to the very end. Right? See, this is why it's scary. My hope and trust is that Jesus has saved me, and he'll keep me and preserve me by his spirit. That's my hope. That's my trust. Because there are people who begin the race but never finish it. And there are people that you look at, you don't even think they're in the race, but they finish with a bang and put everyone else to shame. Someone that if you told me for a million years he went to heaven, I'd be shocked. Samson. Man, just read the story of Samson from Judges 13 to 16. The man is getting drunk. He's marrying a, Canaan, a woman from Canaan. He's doing everything God says don't do. And then Hebrews 11 mentions him as a man of faith. One of those who inherited the kingdom of heaven. He's, met, he's listed in Hebrews 11. As a man of faith who received the reward of an eternal city, heaven, heavenly Jerusalem, where God dwells. Had it not been for Hebrews 11, I would have been still questioning whether he's saved or not. And then this is a man that in Judges 16, 1, don't take my word for it, it says he went to Gaza, found a prostitute, and slept with her. Now, God forbid you find a Christian brother, God forbid, May it never happen in the blood of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. May this never happen to any of us. But let's say, God forbid, I don't mean to abuse you, but Akadi, we catch him sleeping with a prostitute. Automatically, you'd say he's not a Christian. But that doesn't mean he's not a Christian any more than Sa Samson wasn't saved. It just meant that he fell into sin. That's it. This is why we have to be very hesitant. And we're not. I'll say be hesitant before you pass judgment. But I'm sending everyone to hell. Oh, this person, forget him. He's as if I'm holier than thou, I'm the righteous judge. In reality, in reality, it's very hard to pinpoint what a Christian should look like because we know what the Bible says. Be holy, shun evil, flee from immorality, right? Hate sin, love righteousness. But in reality, how many of us are doing it completely and perfectly? Some do it better than others. How much must you strive against sin to show that you're a believer? Well, if you looked at Samson, it didn't look like he was striving at all, right? So you have to be careful in assuming someone is saved or not saved. If the person says he's saved, okay, I'll, I'll, on the basis of your profession, I don't have axe to your heart, amen. And he may even be doing stuff that you don't like. That still doesn't mean he's not saved. It may mean that right now in a season he's doing things that displease the Lord, but then the Lord's going to get his attention. And he will if you belong to him. So we have to be very careful, right? Very careful. Even the apostles did not know with absolute certainty who among them was truly saved? Did you know that? Did you know even the apostles didn't have that knowledge? Can I prove that to you? A bunch of, I don't want to scare you guys, but I don't also want to tickle your ears. 
it's okay. It's all about the blood of Jesus. Yeah, it is the blood of Jesus. But the blood of Jesus is not cheap. The blood of Jesus is the most precious thing that God gave up for your salvation. And your attitude should be one of gratitude and going out of your way to show him your thanks. But some of us take the blood of Jesus as an excuse. That's okay. I'm, I'm, I'm forgiven. No, that's not the attitude. But at the same time, if someone is in sin, that doesn't mean he's not saved. You have to be very careful. So there's a danger, right? Let me give you an example of someone whom Paul thought was a believer. Turns out he wasn't. You ready? Go to Colossians 4, verse 14. Read out loud the beloved physician, send me greetings, and also Demas. Okay. Now, why would you tell me you just did when I'm looking for Demas? Was Demas in 14? Okay, so then repent for your error that you imposed on me. That's one. Number two, read Colossians 4, 10, and 11. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, send you his greeting, and also Barnabas, uh, Barnabas' cousin, uh, Mark, about whom you receive instruction, so if he comes to you, welcome him. And also, Jesus, who is called Justice, uh, these are the only fellow workers for the kingdom of God who are from the circumcision, and they have proved to be an encouragement to me. Okay, now notice, in verse 10, he mentions Aristarchus, then it says Mark, 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 the cousin of Barnabas, Mark, then he mentions the Jesus called Justice, and then don't forget 14, which is the key that I want you to look at. Besides, look, he mentions Demas, right? Now, we believe Paul's inspired, right? So who's inspiring Paul to mention these co-workers of his? Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Now, he wouldn't mention them if he thought they were fake Christians, right? Now, out of the five that he mentioned, four will be mentioned again in Philemon 24. As do Mark, Arsene, uh, Demas, Luke, my fellow workers. So notice the same four names mentioned in Colossians 4, 10, and 14. Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, right? Again, who's inspiring Paul to mention them? Because we don't believe that Paul just wrote it because he had nothing better to do. We believe the Spirit moved them. Paul write. Paul write this letter, right? So the Spirit wants Paul to include these names. All right. Go to 2 Timothy 4, 10 to 11. For Demas, having loved this present world, has deserted me. And Demas abandoned Paul. This is Paul's last letter before he's about to be martyred and enter glory. The same Demas that he mentioned as a co-worker who also sent greetings to the churches that Paul wrote to when Paul was in prison the first time around. And the last letter of Paul, right when he's, before he gets martyred, he says, Demon, Demas, because of the, the love of the world, has abandoned me. He loved the world more than the faith, and he abandoned me. Didn't Paul know that this man wasn't a believer who's going to walk away? Even he didn't know. But the Holy Spirit knew, right? The Holy Spirit knew, right? So why would the Holy Spirit have him mention someone whom the Spirit knows would turn away as a lesson? Even the apostles did not know who truly belonged to the Lord. And it's not who begins the race, it's he who finishes it that is truly saved. And that's what you're supposed to learn. Here you see the wisdom of the Holy Spirit. Here, I'm going to mention him in these two letters, and I'm going to shock every one of you. By the time Paul is about to enter glory, he finishes the race. Demons does it. He abandons it because he loves the world. So even the apostles did not know who actually belonged to the Lord. Because God didn't make it known to them. Secondly, this is a lesson from the Holy Spirit. Demas began the race, but he never finished it. And it's those who finish that show they belong to the Lord, not those who begin. This is Matthew 24, verse 13. Go to Matthew 24, 13. But the one who endures to the end, he will be saved. See, that's the one who gets saved. Now, does that mean my salvation is dependent on my own efforts and work? No. My salvation is completely the work of the Holy Spirit because he's the one who preserves me and keeps me and enables me to run the race till I finish it. It's the work of grace. But that's the whole point. On this side of eternity, you have hope, you have confidence, you have faith, you have trust, and you believe you belong to Jesus, he'll keep you, right? And that's your hope every day. Lord, I'm yours. Lord, I belong to you. Tighten your leash on my neck. Tighten your bit in my mouth. Don't let me go, I beg you, from your Holy Spirit. Because I'm trusting your spirit to keep me. And as long as your spirit keeps me, I'll remain faithful to the end. So that's your hope. That's your trust. That's your confidence. Your confidence is not in yourself. It's in him and keeping you. Go to 2 Timothy 1, 8 to 12. 
Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, or of me, prisoner, or of his prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel according to the power of God, who has saved us and called us with his holy calling, with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace. So he didn't save us because of our works. He saved us because of his grace. Keep reading. Which was granted uh, to mm -hmm. us in Christ Jesus for, for all eternity. But now has been revealed by the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to life through the gospel. Yeah, in other words, because of the resurrection of Christ, we know we have immortal life because he ushered it in by destroying death. And where did you hear that? You heard it when the gospel was preached to you. Because what did the gospel that you heard say? Christ died, but God raised them to life, never to die again. So it's through the gospel we know we have immortality in the one who destroyed death and ushered in immortality, the Lord Jesus Christ. But you got to trust in him, right? Now keep reading. This is my favorite part is verse 12. Watch what's going to happen. For which I was appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher. For this reason I also suffered these things, but I am not ashamed. For I know whom I, I have believed, and I am con see, convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until that day. See, I'm not trusting in myself to guard myself. I believe, am convinced, fully persuaded, he will keep perfectly what I've entrusted to him till that day, the day of the coming of our Lord. And what has he entrusted to him? His very life. Go to 2 Timothy 4. <laughs> 16 to 18. 2 Timothy 4, 16 to 18. At my first defense, no one supported me, but all deserted me. May, may it not be counted against them. See, everyone deserted me. They abandoned me. May God not count this against them. Right? So he's praying for mercy for them. Keep going. But the Lord stood with me and strengthened me. Hallelujah. This is what I want you to focus on. All my worldly friends abandoned me, but my true friend... My best friend, my Lord, stood with me. Does that move you in the spirit? All my friends abandoned me. People that I thought were closer than a brother. When the going got rough, they got going. But the Lord Jesus stood with me. we we'll finish it. So that through me the proclamation might be fully accomplished, and that all, all the Gentiles might hear. And I was rescued out of the lion's mouth. So one thing I know and I'm convinced and fully assured of, my Lord Jesus will never abandon me. He will remain with me. He will strengthen me. He will preserve, preserve me. And I am persuaded he will preserve that which I've entrusted to him. See, that's the hope of every Christian. Your hope is, Lord, preserve me. Lord, Keep me in your love. Lord, here's my heart. Here's my soul. They are yours completely. Preserve them. Safeguard them until I see you face to face. So that's hope of the Christian. See, it moves me in the spirit because when Paul wrote this, he's about to be beheaded. This was his last letter. And after he wrote this letter, as a Roman citizen, they wouldn't crucify Roman citizens. They would kill them. So he was beheaded. How do I know this is his last letter? Verses 6 to 8 tells you. 2 Timothy 4, to, 4 6 to 8. I'm already being poured out as a drink offering at the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the course, and I have kept the faith. In the future, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award, award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who love, who, who have loved his appearing. His appearing, right? So glory to God. The point is, remember... Although God tells us to hate sin, love holiness, and pursue radical holiness and obedience, you may find someone who may be living in a, in a season of sin, but that still doesn't mean he's not a believer. And then you may find someone who is like turning the world upside down, preaching and teaching and praying. And, see, and then at the end, he turns away never to walk with the Lord again.